Welcome to Band Talk with Charlie Mangini and Friends. The only podcast where it's okay to talk in band. On this podcast, you will be able to hear conversations with some of the greatest names in wind band conducting, composing, and arranging. We'll also visit with great college, high school, middle school, and elementary band directors to get their thoughts on various aspects of being a band director. We'll have regular check-ins with instrument specialists, music dealers, and instrument repair professionals. And if that's not enough, we'll even have regular conversations with Dr. Tim, who will help keep us motivated. That's Band Talk with Charlie Mangini and Friends. And now, here's Charlie. Welcome to Band Talk with Charlie Mangini and Friends. And this, my 50th podcast and my 11th in season two. I am so happy that you're joining me for another great conversation. And today I visit with Jim Yarnell, who is the band director at the American School in The Hague. After graduating from Ball State, Jim started teaching in Indiana and was teaching with the legendary Al Castronovo at Chesterton High School in Indiana when he met his wife of Dutch descent and, well, the rest is history. Talking with Jim brought back so many memories of my earlier years as a school band director and the wonderful times I had to spend with Jim's mentor, teacher, and our friend, Al Castronovo. Jim has a great story to tell, And I know you're going to find it interesting to hear how music education and band is different in an American school in Europe versus an American school right here in the USA. Jim is a fantastic person and a great teacher. And you're going to learn more about Jim Yarnell right after this. This is Drew with thepodcastingstore.com, your one-stop shop for everything podcasting and remote learning, and a proud sponsor of Band Talk with Charlie Mangini and Friends. Listen to what we've been working on in this clip from our podcast. But then I discovered that the audio that I had sounded horrible. Uh, it had no presence to it, no depth, no volume, and I could not figure out what was going on. So I dumped it into Audacity, did a bunch of compression and loudness normalization, trying to you know, bring up the volume. I figured, you know, was there something wrong with the microphone? It still sounded like garbage. So then I just dumped the audio track into Shotcut and then rendered that up um, with uh, increasing the decibels by about 10 and then dumped it back on Audacity and it still sounded horrible. So at this point, I'm really, really frustrated. So I put the project aside and on my computer uh, opened up and was watching a movie. And a funny thing happened with that. The sound on that was horrible too. So I figured there must be something wrong with my computer. So I rebooted it and started up again and had the exact same problem. To hear the rest of this podcast, please visit thepodcastingstore.com, your one-stop shop for everything podcasting and remote learning. This is Drew with thepodcastingstore.com. Now back to Charlie. Well, when I took the job at Vandercook College in 1994, the, uh, the grand old man at the time at Vandercook was a guy by the name of Vic Zajac, who was the band director. And... Vic uh, was just a gentleman's gentleman and just so articulate and so knowledgeable about so many things. And we'd have a lot of conversations. And I remember one time he was saying, you know, Charlie, uh, you got to meet this graduate of ours who's over teaching in, in the Netherlands. He says, his name is Jim Yarnell. And he says, he's a sharp guy. And he says, you know, the two of you really need to get to get to know each other. And, and I guess it was probably maybe a Midwest clinic or two later that Jim was at the the Midwest Clinic and Vic was there and all of a sudden I got introduced and we started a friendship that's been kind of distant for the last, what, 20 some years. And it's just a real honor uh, to welcome uh, Vandercook alum, a guy from the great state of Indiana. And he's Jim Yarnell who teaches, I believe at the American School in The Hague. Is that correct, Jim? That's that's correct. Yes, that's correct. So thanks for joining us for the podcast. All right. It's an honor and a privilege, Charlie. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm looking forward to this. This It's been uh, a while. I think the last time I saw you 
was what? Was I in Berlin doing something or were you at, mid at Midwest? It was probably at a Midwest, at a, Midwest. Uh, a few years ago. And then of course you were in Berlin before that doing a, one of the music conferences we had. Yeah, great. So, but let's, well, let's just start by talking about you a little bit about where you grew up and how you got started playing in band, Jim. Okay, well, I, uh, I grew up in, uh, those of you from Indiana and from the Midwest, the Chicagoland area would know, I grew up in a town called Crown Point, Indiana. Uh, Crown Point, Indiana is a, at the time was a small uh, suburbia uh, uh, town uh, located, oh, probably about an hour from the loop. Uh, it was a wonderful town, a wonderful place to grow up in. Uh, good schools, good, uh, good environment. And also what was really cool about Crown Point was that it was so close to Chicago. And from a very young age, I can remember having this, uh, this op these opportunities to go to the museums and my mom would drag me to the concerts in Chicago and we would uh, partake in the culture, the rich cultural life. So it was a wonderful place to, uh, to, uh, to grow up. Um, I went to a I went to a, a, a Catholic uh, elementary school. It was called St. Mary's uh, School in Crown Point. Still there, as far as I understand. And I can remember in uh, in fifth grade, uh, there was a gentleman who came into the into the school. His name was Mr. Mayet. Okay, Charles Mayet was his name, and he had an associate named David Levis. And they said, kids, we're going to start something here. We're going to start a band program. We're going to start a beginning band program in the fifth grade. He was like, no one ever done that before. And do you all want to play in the band? And uh, uh, we took these aptitude tests and so on. And then they had the parent evening. And my mom took me to the parent evening. We met in the basement, which was a gym of the old St. Mary's School. And that's where I met Mr. Mayette, Charles Mayette. And he said, do you want to play an instrument? And I said, yeah, I think I do. He says, uh, well, what do you think? I said, I'm not really sure. And he, he literally said to me, and you talk about these, these one night experiences that, that change your life. He looked at me and he said, you know what? You're a tall boy, you have long arms. Why don't you try playing the trombone? And that was it. I came home with the trombone that night. I started in band the next, the next day. And that's, that's where I started to become a, a trombone player in, in, in Crown Point, um, in, in Crown Point, Indiana, in the basement of St. Mary's School with Mr. Mayette and, uh, and Mr. Debus. And uh, I liked it. Um, they said, you got to practice. So I, I practiced. And, you know, there's all these life-changing social experiences, uh, cognitive uh, relationship experiences that connect you with music. And it took me out of a shell and it just transformed me as a person. Um, that's where it all started, actually. That's uh, yeah. the, my music, my music part of my life started in fifth grade. And I was fortunate enough to have gentlemen like Mr. Mayette and Mr. Debus, who, uh, who were uh, future minded enough to say, let's, uh, let's start a band program here. So, and then by the time you get to high school, you're still in the band and you get to study with the legendary Al Castronovo, who was at Crown Point and later on went to Chesterton. And, and that Crown Point, I, when Al was there, in fact, he took his jazz band, I believe, to the Midwest Clinic, didn't he? Were you in that band? You know, it's funny that you mentioned this because I was thinking, well, what should I talk about with Crown Point? And I thought, well, one of the things I really, really have to talk about, and one of my most memorable high school experiences at Crown Point High School, and then again, this was when Al Castronovo was the band director, uh, this was my sophomore year. Uh, I didn't know what Midwest was as a sophomore in high school. I didn't know what the Midwest clinic was, you know, uh, he, he, I got, uh, I auditioned and was able to get into the jazz band there at Crown Point in my sophomore year. And he said, all right, gang, we're going, we've been invited as the first jazz band to play at this place called the Midwest clinic. And I went, wow, that sounds pretty cool. So I remember that as being one of my most uh, profound uh, high school experiences, playing, playing in the grand ballroom at the Hilton Hotel in the, no, actually, no, it wasn't the Hilton Hotel. I'm going back farther. It was- uh, You're still at the, the Sherman Sh House? Sherman House, yes, sorry. It was the Sherman House. And uh, just a crowd full of people and I was scared to death and we played this concert. But I think one of the things, you talk about making connections and how music and how music connects. 
Um, I can remember doing the warm up for that because nobody had heard a jazz band at Midwest before. Or at least I didn't, I, that was my, that, that's what I thought. This was 50 years ago, mind you. And um, nobody heard a jazz band and uh, Al was uh, doing our warm up. Our, we got a chance to, uh, to do our warm up playing in the, in the grand ballroom there. And this gentleman comes in and stands next to the band. And I was kind of going, you know, I, you know, I don't know who he is. And during the, during the break, you know, the guy said, you know, you guys sound really, really good. I, I, really, I really think you're really, really cool. It's really nice to have you here. Do you, you mind if I come in and play in with you once? And, and Al Kashinov was, was like shaking. And he says, no, please be my guest, Mr. Krupa, Gene Krupa. You know, and it was like, <laughs> you know, and here I am as a, as a high school sophomore going, I, I can't believe that this is happening to me. You know, I just, you know, I'm on stage in a major hotel in Chicago playing for a couple, I don't know how many people, how many hundreds, thousands of people. And there's Gene Krupa in the background wanting to know what's going on. So um, I knew then, I, uh, by that time I knew that, that music, I don't know what form of music, what avenue of music, but I knew that music was gonna be some part of my life somehow, somewhere I was gonna make this uh, I was going to make this happen and, uh, and, uh, and do this somehow as a teacher, as a player, as both. I, I, I wasn't sure just then, but it was, I mean, I had, I just had dozens of wonderful high school experiences with, uh, with Al. And I can go on and talk to him more about that because my association with him, uh, didn't, didn't end in high school. In fact, it got closer and deeper. Uh, and personal um, with uh, with uh, the families and everything with uh, with Al. I can go into in a bit. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I but, had the chance um, to meet Al. It was an incredible. It was an incredible. It was an incredible high school. It's just an incredible high school experience. I was I was blessed. Uh, I was blessed uh, uh, to have this musical experience, but especially to have a musical experience with somebody who really became my father figure. I mean. And that was Al. He, he, uh, I could laugh with him. I could shout with him. I could argue with him. I could cry with him. And then I could hug him. You know, he was, yeah. he was your father. And uh, we had a very close relationship in that regard. Yeah, had the chance to meet him uh, when I was teaching. And we did some judging together and did some work together. And you immediately, he, you gravitate to him and you love the guy. And you had so much, you have so much respect for him because he was so damn smart and creative and hardworking and organized mm -hmm. and you name it. I mean, he was at the top, but that's going to be a whole nother podcast sometime. We need to just do a whole thing on Al <laughs> Castronovo. Uh, mm -hmm. And what a I'm happy to be a what, part of that. What a, sure. what a tragic ending it was for him when he left K Chesterton and went to do the festival parade of States and had that accident in Indianapolis at the end of his life. I mean, that was, that was tragic. I remember it like it was yesterday, yeah, but I mean, yeah. Yeah. So what was next for you after high school? Yeah, I understand you went, went to Ball State. I went to Ball State University. I right from day one, I uh, became a music, what they call a music area major, which was sort of a, you did a little bit of everything. Uh, four good years at Ball State. Um, I think that um, in terms of the, in, I, I suppose looking back at Ball State, one of the things that I I remember the most about that is, I appreciated the most about that. It was a large university, but not over the top large, like a private conservatory, uh, where I had a chance, I had, a, as, a, as, a teacher, as a teacher in training, so to speak, I had a chance to do a little bit of everything. I played in the jazz band there under Larry McWilliams, played in the band, the marching band, the wind ensemble, the orchestra, I sang in the choir, uh, and, um, um, eventually ended up becoming the drum major of the marching band and then doing the jazz gigs and tours and everything there. So it turned out to be a, a very, uh, what I appreciated about Ball State is I got, I got a, a lot of everything. And by the time I left uh, Ball State um, uh, to start becoming a high school band director, I felt that I was really, I was really prepared and I really, I really had the tools I need. You know, I mean, I think when you're, when you're a young person, you think that you know everything. And then as I reach these prime years and heading toward retirement, I, I understand all the things that I don't know. <laughs> but I, I felt that I was, I felt that, that I, I had a really good rounded experience there and I'm grateful for what, they, what the visionaries there thought 
And you were there with the legendary War Earl Dunn. Whoa, Earl my Dunn. golly. Whoa, Earl Jimmy. Uh, Earl. Whoa. How was it Dunn. being the drum major in Earl Dunn's band? Tell me a little bit about that, because that had to be well, an experience. You, uh, yeah, well, actually, Earl Dunn had, by the time I was there, Earl Dunn had become the, the I, I guess, the head of the School of Music. Well, there was Hargraves, and I think- Yeah, he was the was assistant, like, right? He was the assistant yeah, chair, right? Uh, I, was, uh, I was in the band there. Uh, our band director at the time of Ball State was Roger McConnell. Oh, T. Roger. T. Roger. T. Yeah. Roger McConnell. Had chalk yeah. dust all over him all the time. He was just, exactly. oh exactly. man, that's great. And uh, what I appreciate about, about Roger is uh, is that he really gave us latitude in the band to to give us, you know, to develop ideas. At that time, uh, it was kind of novel. I was very much into the core style of marching, which in that time, this goes back to the, to the mid 70s, was still kind of a novelty in in bands, in high school bands, but certainly in college bands. And uh, we were able to introduce that and bring uh, a, a certain different style of marching to the, to the college scene, which, uh, which was really cool. And, and the teaching experience that I had there as, 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 as drum major, um, um, again, prepared me for the years I was gonna have ahead of me, for sure. Yeah. So you graduate from Ball State and then I, I trust you're teaching somewhere in the Midwest? Well, okay, so what happened, while, while I was going to school at Ball State, I was able, uh, you have to keep in mind that Al, Al was, uh, uh, I'm going to keep on coming back to Al because he was such an influence in my sure. life. Sure. Um, Al uh, went to Chesterton and he said, I have a summer job for you, uh, Jim. He says, I'm going to start a marching band here at Chesterton. And I'd like for you to be involved in and start the training with the with the drum majors and the and the marching technique and so on with the with the, with the kids. Now, what so, year was that, Jim? Uh, well, that would have been starting in the summer of summer of seventy five. Okay. Uh, 19, 1975. Uh, so my summer jobs were basically teaching teaching beginning band during the day, which was just an incredible experience for me to have that hands on experience. And again, I. I, I appreciate and respect Al for giving me that chance to do that as a, as a college, uh, uh, you know, as a, uh, as a college student, uh, to be able to have that charge, but also to be actually, you know, pretty much co-assisting the, the marching band program there. Um, and it was just really wonderful in those early stages of the Chesterton band to, to be involved in that process and to see how Al was working. So I graduated from I, those were my summer jobs, and I graduated from uh, I graduated from Ball State, and then I actually took a job as a high school band director in a in a smaller rural school south of Crown Point called Kankakee Valley High School. Uh, I was there for a couple for, for a few years, and while I was there, uh, Al, it was this was about forty five minutes down the road from Chesterton, actually, and while I was there, Al said. Um, I've got, I've got the band position opening up at Chesterton. Uh, he was the head of school music and doing the, doing the programs, but he said, I'd like to have you on the Chesterton team. Can you come and teach at Chesterton High School? So I ended up leaving Kankakee Valley and actually working, working for Al uh, during just, uh, just glory years at, the, at, the, at Chesterton. So I had the chance of seeing this program start from the very beginning in the mid seventies and see its fruition in the early eighties. As, a, as an employee there. And with, if, with Al as my, as my boss, basically he, be, he became my band, he was my band director and he became my boss um, uh, uh, there. Um, I, I wanna go on further with Al because I think it's a story that needs to be told. I had a, a, a like I say, a very close relationship with him. And I, I, I came to a, a point in my life where um, I, I, uh, I fell in love with a Dutch woman uh, and we were living together in the United States for a while and she wanted to go live in the Netherlands. And I thought, okay, you know, let's try this, let's give it a go. Um, so that was the point of my, I was young enough and I thought, well, this is sort of like the road not taken. Why don't we see, let's see what, it's a complete like left turn. Let's see what's happening there because I'm hearing so many fantastic things about the music in Europe, especially in the Netherlands. And, uh, I just, and this was yeah, 38 years ago. <laughs> and uh, um, uh, I decided to come here and, and uh, it was a very tough conversation to have with Al. He said, uh, I, I don't agree with your decision, but I love you and I support you and I wish you the best for it. That was one of the last conversations I had with him. And I'm gonna try to say this without getting a tear in my eye. 
uh, things were going well for me. I got a job at the American school. I started playing quite a bit. I went to the Dutch conservatories to get a degree. I started freelancing as a, with Dutch orchestras and jazz ensembles there. It was going really well. And I said, Al, I, I, I wrote him, I said, Al, we're expecting our first child. Uh, we're expecting our first child and, and this was gonna be in June of 1986. And he wrote me back, he says, oh, I just, this is absolutely incredible. This is wonderful. He says, I want you to know something. He says, I'm gonna make a trip to Europe and I wanna see it. I'm gonna, in the summer of 86, I'm gonna see, I'm gonna see your, I wanna see your baby. I wanna be there and spend some time with you. And uh, I, I have to say that the, the week that my first daughter was born um, was the same week that Al died. Oh in, my God. In, uh, in Indianapolis at the, at the festival, um, I think it was the Indy 500 festival. Yeah. And so you talk about the cycle of life for me. I, I, here I have my baby, my first child in my arms. Uh, and uh, while, I'm holding, while I'm holding her, I'm getting a phone call saying that, that Al Castronova died. And so it was just a real emotional turbulent time for me. And, and you know, you, you get philosophical and spiritual and talk about the cycle of life and, and, the, and those types of things. However, that story continues when um, a couple of years later, um, I, have a, um, I have a second daughter, <laughs> uh, Michelle, who currently teaches in another international school in Norway. Um, I'll make a long story short. Michelle, my second daughter, is born on Al's birthday. <laughs> Wow, and uh, um, she plays clarinet uh, as Al did, and um, she um, is a, is a music teacher, band director, and very active in the Norwegian in the Norwegian band scene in in, North, in the Trondheim area of of, uh, of Norway, and very successful up there. But uh, again, I mean, I have this sort of this. Um, I, I say my relationship with my band director was like this this father son relationship, but it it was more than music. It was it was spiritual, and uh, and I don't think a day goes by when I'm teaching where I don't, I don't, you know, I, I don't think of Val. I mean, we are a culmination of all the people we we meet. That's that's for sure. And and Al was a very important uh, part of that uh, of that culmination in, in how I approach things, how I look at how I look at life, not just music and teaching, but how I look at things. Yeah, he was uh, an incredible influence. So, Jim, where did where did Vandercook fit in with all this? Okay, so while I was uh, while I was finishing at Kankakee Valley in the summer of uh, what was it? I guess it must have been uh, 80, 81, While I was at Chesterton, I did uh, I did uh, Vandercook's Masters of Music program, and I took the summer courses, the four the four year uh, uh, I think it was six weeks, five or six weeks summer courses, yep, six weeks summer courses, and that's where I of course met Vic Zajac. And uh, again, uh, you know, you talk about, again, a culmination of people that you meet and how influential they are. I just was really taken by, by the man and um, taken by all the experiences that I had at Vandercook. And uh, 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 I ended up getting my master's degree, uh, I believe it was 80, 84, 85, master's in music education from, uh, from Vandercook. Um, uh, and then, then, then started teaching overseas. So tell me a little bit about the American School in the Hague. What, mm -hmm. What's what's the makeup? Okay, so so in in uh, this is something that I learned when I got here. Actually, uh, the American School of the Hague is a is a pre K through twelve uh, uh, curricular school. Uh, we we call ourselves an American school. So you, you have to understand that throughout the world there are hundreds of American schools. And uh, the American School was established in 1953. It was actually established in the, in the basement of the American Embassy here. And um, uh, uh, it's grown. Uh, it's a smaller school according, if you compare it to uh, US public school sizes, it's a smaller school. We're, a, like I say, a pre-K through 12 school. We have 1,300 kids in the school. Uh, for an internet, we have 400 kids in the high school. Uh, for an American public school, I, I realize that in most cases that's a small school, but for an internet, for an international school, that's rather that's rather large. We run an American curriculum. We run a we run uh, we're fully accredited by uh, New England Association of Secondary Schools, by Council of International Schools. We run music program, fine arts program, band, choir, orchestra, AP, IB. Uh, uh, we have drama, art, music, dance, photography, robotics. Uh, we have um, 
it, it, it's a really American style of school. You have to understand uh, American schools have really changed though in the last, um, well, I would say the last decade or so. Um, when, when I first went to the school, when I first started teaching at the American school, I would say 74, 75%, three fourths for sure of the school was actually American. Uh, was an American population. And these were basically kids from the embassy personnel and from international businesses. It was primarily oil, Shell oil, the BP oil. They were stationed in the Hague North Sea. Oil was very big at the time. Over the course of the last decade or so, the, the texture of the school has really shifted as have most American schools overseas in that they've become more international and the curriculum has, has adapted itself to teaching, to teaching from this American style to the international style. We currently have more than 70 different nationalities in the school. And you can, any one day you'll hear, you'll hear 20 different languages going on. Uh, the instructional language is, um, is English. Uh, it's kind of interesting to be in the band rehearsals because you might have kids new to the school that don't speak English, but they play a band instrument. And, and so you're correct, you're, you're doing the band and you have to stop for a second to give kids a chance to translate for one another what's going on and then, and then go in there. So the school has really taken on a, an international, an international uh, texture, an international approach to its curriculum. But at the heart and soul of this has been this American style, this American approach. Therefore, uh, within the school, the arts, sports are very big and are very much a part, of, very much a part of the program. And there's a there's a a, a great amount of time um, spent uh, intertwining, interweaving the curriculum of the arts with the academic curriculum. So you, it's quite common to see the academic teachers tying into the arts to use the arts for their uh, for their for their academic studies in the classroom. Um, yeah, it's a, it's just, it turned out to be just an incredible place, incredible place to work. So what kind of ensembles do you have there? Um, okay. At the school, we have a, uh, we, we have a high school concert band. We have a, a jazz band, we have a high school orchestra. We have a, a choir, a swing choir. Uh, and then we have, uh, dozens <laughs> of chamber ensembles associated with our, our private lesson program. Uh, in addition to that, we run a very comprehensive uh, international baccalaureate program, which is an international curriculum. I don't know whether I could get into that so much here or now, but we combine this international baccalaureate with the band program, with the performing ensembles, uh, which uh, combines the, the performance side of, of making music with the research side and with the composing side. Um, uh, associated with that, we have a, a, a very, very popular uh, music technology program, uh, uh, which is, which has been very, very popular, uh, very, very popular with the kids. You know, you very, mentioned the, the relationship that you had with, with Mr. Castronovo. Uh, and I'm sure that that's completely different now that you're teaching and teaching in an American school. What, what do the students there expect from you as their teacher? Um, we, we have a relationship um, right from day one, which is based on honesty and based on trust. And um, I, I say to the kids, and I don't know, maybe I can say this because I'm a little bit older and I have the freedom of saying this, but I'm going to say, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't have all the answers. I don't know everything there is to know. And I said, you, you couldn't do me a, a, a bigger honor and to get into something and start telling me something or start doing something that I either don't know or that I can't do myself. And so there's this, um, if I was to make sort of a bulleted point of the words that would describe the relationship between student and teacher, it's, it's mutual respect, mutual trust, uh, mutual honesty. I, I expect honesty from my students, trust from my students, respect from my students. Uh, by the same token, it's uh, it's something that that I model in in, in the students, and um, it, that's evident in every yeah in every corridor and every in every thread of everything that happens in the school, whether it be the classroom, the the musicals, the concerts, the ensembles, the rehearsals, the travel. Uh, it it's something that's that's expected. Um, 
open honesty. Uh, if the kids have a problem, they know immediately where they can come to, who they can come to. I think in an international expat world, that's uh, incredibly important um, uh, because students uh, are, are away from their homes. And uh, in, in their teacher, I think that they find a sort of anchor, especially someone like me who's been at the school for, for ages, uh, they find some sort of anchor and some sort of uh, security uh, in being able to, uh, to be able to confide in, uh, in their teacher. Um, and I think that's, that's, um, that's facilitated because of the fact that we're making music and because, um, you know, I have a little thing on the bottom of my emails that says music is what feelings sound like. And um, uh, I, I, I have these experiences again, uh, again with students, I says, I don't care how many notes you hit wrong or how many mistakes you make, but I want you to do your best. And uh, I want you to know that we're in a very special moment here. We're in a very special place. We're able to make music together. And regardless of that, of what it sounds like, let's, let's cherish this moment we are together right now. Was sort of finds, finds the atmosphere at the school. Yeah, right? yeah. Is competition a big part of the programs in Europe and your school? Absolutely not. No, absolutely not. Um, what, what is a big part of the program in our particular school, and when I mentioned this to my colleagues that still teach in the United States, um, one, you mentioned about you know, talking about the program. Um, one thing that we managed um, several years ago in the school, I, I think one of, certainly one of my proudest accomplishments that I, when I look back at the school, uh, in the fifth and sixth grade, we require every kid in the school to play an instrument and to sing. There's nobody left out. There's nobody who's not playing an instrument and not, and not, or not singing. Now we don't have them choose that until after, after sixth grade where they can continue to go in band or orchestra or, or sing in choir. But um, it lends itself to the inclusivity of music. And I think that that's, that's probably one of the things that I, I'm most proud about about the American school, that music is in fact for everyone, that everyone deserves a shot at this because you just, you just never know. So I'm not going to tell you what those initial beginning ensembles might sound like. The point is, is that they, they're all making, all kids are making music, making and performing, and many, in many cases, creating music, which is, it's, a, it's an essential part of the program. Yeah. You know, I, I, a few years ago, I had an opportunity to, to, it's been more than a few years ago. You knew, you knew Guido Six, Guido Six, I'm sure, you know, wonderful band teacher and clarinet guy over there in, in Austed. Uh, and uh, it was actually, he was in Belgium, right? He was on the, the neighboring country there, but I, and I was there, it just seemed that those, the arts and music, uh, plays such a much greater role in society, you know, and especially in the Netherlands and Belgium and that, uh, that part of the world. I mean, people place more value in it. Um, is that a fair assessment? Yes, it's a very fair assessment. And, and why do you think that is? Oh, I, I think a lot of it has to do with, uh, with just the culture of the country. The arts, historically, I mean, we go back to the Renaissance <laughs> for that matter. Um, uh, the arts are, are very important and they're embedded in the culture of this country, not just music, but, but, but visual arts and dance. I mean, we, I, I mean, look at the Dutch orchestras and look at the Dutch ballets and look at the Dutch contemporary operas. I mean, they're, they're world-class. So there's a, there's a great amount still, uh, even after the cutbacks in, in government spending all over the world and so on, but there is a priority spent on the national pride, of course, that being the Concert Cabal Orchestra and the National Ballet uh, Theater, the, Mas the National Dance Company, all right? Those, those programs are, are subsidized by the government and those are all models. All of these, all of these professional organizations um, have connections, not necessarily just to schools, but to what the Dutch call Verenigings. Um, the Verenigings life is like a, is like a club. It's like um, uh, you might you might have. How, I'm trying to compare it to something that you might have in the United States. Something like Little League. You know, you have Little League, which is a club. It's an after-school activity that isn't really associated with the school, but it's sort of a big part of the community. Well, every village in the Netherlands will have a music vereniging, 
And in many cases, that's not, that, that is a, there's a band. It could be anything from a band to a jazz band, to a Dixieland combo, to a brass quintet, to a choir, to a string ensemble. But these are all supported by the local communities. So if you, if you look at music, and you're getting back to the competition part of it and, 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 and the area, the idea of arts and schools and arts in general in society. Um, the, I, look, I look back at the United States programs, of course, like Chesterton with, with envy because those are school music programs. They're, 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 they're funded and they're supported by the school. The school is the part of the community. Uh, you won't see schools over here with programs like that. They're the band, the band, and the and the, or, the the bands and the music programs really won't be. I mean, you can get music training in schools, but it would be part of the Veranikin life. Students are given a release time from school uh, a, a couple times a week to go to the Veranikin, and they can choose which Veranikin they want to go to. Uh, where the Veranikin it takes over the uh, takes over the instruction of the music and the development of the music. So it's very common in almost every village is to have uh, grandma, uh, grandpa, uh, father, and son sitting run right next to the other in the ensemble because it becomes it becomes a way uh, bands, not just bands, but any type of music activity uh, becomes a way of life. In fact. If you, if for those of you listening, if you're ever in the Netherlands, uh, one of the hotbeds in the world of of band playing is in the southern province of the Netherlands called Limburg, and um, they they they're th this area you know is just is just huge, and I don't know what it is about Limburg or the history behind it, but this area is huge on bands, the community bands. There's a town in Limburg called Torn, T-H-O-R-N. And they have two of the, of the finest 100 piece wind ensembles, wind bands that you can ever imagine. I mean, I've heard uh, military bands that couldn't, that, that, that couldn't play like, like both of these groups could play. Uh, if you go to this village, it's kind of austere because almost everyone in this village plays an instrument or certainly knows somebody who plays an instrument or goes to the concerts. And you ask, well, where do you guys rehearse? And you, you say, well, you go down to the, to the local pub, right? So you go into the pub, you go, well, I, I was told the band rehearsals were here. You gotta go upstairs in, the, in this pub. And there is a whole state of the art rehearsal facility in this, in this, re in this rehearsal hall where they rehearse you know, several evenings a week. And then afterwards, of course, they're down at the pub and they're talking about the community and the band and, the, and everything. I should probably qualify the competition. There's, there's two ensembles that are just world, world class. I, I'd love to see either one of these two at Midwest sometime because they would knock everyone's socks off, either one of them. But these two ensembles are, are really in competition with each other. You know, they're, 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 in fact, there was a, there was a one story, one folklore story of how the trumpet player of one band fell in love with the clarinet player of another band. And it turned out to be a big Romeo and Juliet drama in the community, how you, how you, could, how you could have a relationship with somebody from the other band. But it's all, it's all good fun. And the whole idea that you can have this small village, you know, in the middle of nowhere, it's a farming village um, uh, and have literally, <laughs> you know, the, the majority of, of people in this village playing, playing an instrument. It's, it's absolutely incredible. So, you know, getting back to your question, there, the, whole, the whole idea of the, of the culture of art, the culture of music that goes back generations, even centuries in this country, that it's, it's something that's respected. It's something that's valued. It's something that's part of the, of the Dutch way of life, um, that, you know, you'll be a part of you'll be a part of something, you'll have some sort of cultural activity. And then to have the access to the concerts that are here, oh my word, and have access to, um, to the amateur, uh, the, the level of amateur music playing in this country is, I've never heard anything like this, like it before. Um, I heard, I don't know whether it's true or not, but I heard Holland has the highest percentage of amateur music makers than any other country in the world. And I just think it has to do with this, how music is embedded in social, in the social culture of, uh, of life, 
of life in the Netherlands. So let's shift gears here for just a minute. I'm sure like the rest of the world, COVID found its way to the Netherlands, to, to The Hague, impacted your community, your school, your students, impacted you. So what, when it first did impact you, how did you continue to teach music you know, during that time? <laughs> Oh boy. Um, I mean, here, I, I think like everyone else, it, it seemed like this happened overnight. We, we went home on a Friday and we said, we're not going to be back in school and we don't know when. And they, and, um, and so you're scrambling. Uh, we, gosh, what did we do? We did, we experimented. We, we were fortunate enough to have music technology available to all kids. So we had all kids on laptops and we did just a lot of virtual virtual training, students had to submit um, their recordings um, uh, via this thing called Flipgrid. And uh, uh, we did individual recordings. We did manage to put together in spring of last year, we did manage to put together a, uh, a Zoom concert. We did manage to play graduation, but it was all electronic. So every kid, every kid had to play their part. They had headphones on, they had to go with the ticks on the, on the machine. They had to play their part. And then we took each one of these parts uh, uh, from, the, the, from the entire band and we mixed it into a, uh, into a sequencing program. I think it was Logic Pro. And uh, um, we put it on a Zoom broadcast. And I have to say, it actually sounded, it sounded pretty good. The thing is, is that you're working with kids one-on-one. -on -one, you have no idea what this sounds like. And then, uh, and then you know, all of a sudden you see it all there together. Um, I think that... Uh, currently, and I think this is the case, I don't, I don't know what it's like in, in most areas of the United States, but we are on a very strict lockdown here. We, um, we just last month went back to schools uh, since Christmas. We've been teaching virtually since then. Uh, we are in what we call a hybrid situation right now at school where we have half the kids and on campus and half the kids virtually, um, which is just, you know, for music, it's, a, it's, it's, it's not easy. Um, uh, you know, we, we, there's a Dutch expression that goes for, for every disadvantage, you have to seek an advantage in every disadvantage. And it certainly was a disadvantage not to be able to have a full ensemble. And we understood that that just wasn't going to happen. And it's still not going to happen. We're not allowed to play or sing in a, in a room. Uh, that's Dutch. That's the Dutch law, Dutch protocol. We're just not allowed to do that. So yeah, I, we still have private um, lessons, you know, students submit their private work online, but I've used this time actually to get the kids to write, to, to do a lot of writing of music. And, um, you know, because of the performance schedule and everything, we never really had this much opportunity uh, to, to write and to, and, to, and to create things. So we started several different research and writing projects in the band where the band, the kids had to create their own little part. It turned out to be just, a, we're just finishing up the, the unit now. Kids had to create for a small ensemble of about uh, a dozen musicians. And they had to write, they had to develop a, a motif, a melodic line and so on. And they had to arrange it for instruments. And they just had to put it out there. We used, uh, we used note flight for this. And uh, then they had to give it to their peers and their peers had to look at their part, uh, what, their, what their colleagues said. And they said, well, this will work on the clarinet, but you can't do that on clarinet. And the baritone sax can't play that high. You got to do this here. So kids are really getting some really uh, wonderful experiences in arranging and orchestration and understanding how the mechanics of, of composition works. So um, I, I think that that has been a, a byproduct of COVID that we were able to get into this, into something more and spend time with it. The kids have been wonderful. They all are in band because they want to play, but understand that they, they, they can't do it. Uh, so, so this has been a, just a, a, real, a real interesting and, and, and lovely byproduct of, uh, of, of, of COVID. Um, the other thing that I'd like to say about, about COVID is, um, you know, as a teacher, um, it, it's made me reflect and understand how much learning goes on in a rehearsal that's not said, okay? So I realized how much teaching 
I, I, maybe I just took this for granted and maybe this goes back to my whole training, you know, as a, as a teacher, I realized how I could communicate with students in the way I looked at them or my facial expression or the way I stood or putting my arms down or feeling low or feeling high, you know, the, a lot of the nonverbal communication as a band director is, is critical. And there's a lot of assessment and a lot of learning that goes on from that standpoint. The other thing about making music is, I don't care how many lesson plans we can do or how, what we try to, how we try to uh, modify it or plan it out, but there's no substitute for making music together as a group and responding to what the person next to you is doing. That, that happens instantaneously. You know, I have an expression I have something that I say to the kids, uh, if you give me goosebumps, I know this has been a pretty good rehearsal. I don't care about the concert. If I get goosebumps now, it's been pretty good. But I say to them, I wanna, I wanna try to find out where the goosebumps come from. If, if I can write a method book about how to get goosebumps, I'd probably be a millionaire. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but, but that type of an approach, and again, this goes back to the wonderful mentors I had, not just Al, but going back to, to, to Vic, and, um, and Mr. Mayette and all these guys, they were, they, there's something that I think that as band directors, um, we all just sort of take this for granted sometime that of course we have bands and of course we make music and of course we do this. But I think what COVID has taught us is how essential our work is, not just as band directors, but as human beings uh, to, to teach kids the emotional, how the emotional side of their lives are connected to the cognitive side and playing music live and responding in an, in an auditory art like, like music. Uh, there's a lot of learning that, that happens that we're not aware of that comes back even years, decades later. I mean, I don't have, I don't have to say this to you. I'm talking to the master right now, but um, I mean, you get that and, you, and you, uh, you understand that, but I think that the absence of not being able to have live rehearsals has really articulated uh, that to me, uh, has really emphasized how, how essential. And this is the first time in my life I've gone almost a year now without conducting, you know, without conducting a band or playing, you know, playing in an ensemble and I can feel it. I mean, I, can, I, I just feel it in my, in my soul. I feel it. And I think that regardless of the way it sounds like when we start playing again, I think it's going to be traumatic and, and, and just, I, I'm going to, I, I think I'm just going to be, I'm already having tears in my eyes thinking about when we can start doing that again. I'm grateful for the fact that um, it's not, you know, that, 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 it, that it happened now. I, next year, I, believe it or not, will be my last year at the American school. I'll be retiring. Um, at the at the at the end of next school year, and I'm just hoping and praying that this COVID uh, scenario seeing subsides, where we can have one last one last you know big hurrah and uh, and have one concert. I hope I can remain standing at the end of that concert. Yeah. I'm sure it's going to be experience. So um, so Jim, from your perspective, as we come out of COVID, uh, what's the biggest challenges music teachers are facing? Oh. Um, being careful and getting everything back up and running again. I think that, I think that um, so many of us have had so many high expectations that literally overnight were taken away from us as teachers. I mean, concerts, competitions, uh, uh, cons you know, all sorts of things were, were robbed from us. I think that there's gonna be, I think one of the biggest challenges we're gonna be facing at the school, and I don't think we're any different from anybody else, is that we're going to want to get everything up and running right away and get it, get it, get it the way it was, you know, quickly. And I am pretty confident in knowing that I just don't think it's going to be that way. I think that this is going to be a gradual process of picking things back up again. And I'm I'm a little bit worried uh, that we as band directors, as music educators, uh, might be thinking that we have to do, we have to get it the way it was right away and, 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 and push things. Uh, I think that we just have to let this take its course 
and gradually come back into this and, and, and get it back together again. I'm worried about the, not just the emotional health, well, not just, the, well, the emotional and physical health of, of, of teachers and students, you know, I should say that there's gonna be so much excitement when we can start doing these things again. I think it's gonna be very, very important to keep everything in its pace and keep everything in its perspective. Say, okay, we're gonna get there eventually. Let's don't, we don't have to, we don't have to, we don't have to race the gas pedal here. Let's, I think that's, I think that's sage advice. I think it has to go organically. I think you're exactly right. Yeah, yeah. I think forcing it is gonna make a total mess out of a lot of things. Yeah. 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 Well, let's and shift gears, was, go ahead. Yeah, and the other thing, you know, that COVID has taught us is that it's really, it's really given us sort of a perspective about, I, I often think, what, what is teaching going to look like after COVID? And, you know, we have gotten into some things with the bands that we would not have gotten into had it not been for COVID. I mean, a lot of it is, is writing music. And I think that we've developed a curriculum enough to think that this is, this is something that we need to keep. The kids, the kids are loving this. You know, I get to hear my own music being played. And uh, um, that those opportunities never happened before. So I'm kind of I'll be curious. I'll be curious to see uh, how that pans out. Yeah, that's that's great. Well, let's shift gears for a second. You know, you live in a culturally rich com- country. So let's say you're going to go out tonight and listen to some music, like, and nothing's off limits. So wh- where are you going to go and what you're going to listen to? Oh boy, that's a tough question, Charlie. Um, well, let, let, let's talk about right now, because of COVID, everything's locked down. <laughs> right now, uh, uh, we wouldn't be able to do that. But when COVID is over on any given night, you could go you could go anywhere. I mean, one night you might find me in a jazz club listening to some rhythm and blues. Uh, the following night, you might see me hanging out at the Concert Cabal trying to get a last minute ticket to hear the orchestra. Um, um, the next day, I might be in part of a of a of a Dixieland uh, jam session. You know, um, uh, Baroque music is is hugely popular here in the Conservatory in the Hague. Uh, the Baroque concerts are are exceptional. So, I mean, every night of the week, there is something going on at the professional and amateur level. Um, people ask me, "What's your favorite kind of music?" I mean, I always. I always revert to jazz into into rhythm and blues, and I think a lot of that has to do with my upbringing in on on the south side of Chicago, <laughs> and and being having Chicago as part of my life. Where I went to school, and, and where I studied with some of the guys from the symphony and so on, and and you know some of the jazz clubs and stuff. I I always find myself coming back to that, um, identifying with that, and I think that that's. Growing up on in the on the southern part, growing up in Chicagoland area, you know, when I was coming of age in the in the late '60s, early '70s, that was a incredibly uh, that was an incredible time in the United States. You know, I mean, not just politically, but the music and the the, the Motown sound and, and all these things. So I find myself gradually, constantly coming back to that. And there's 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 just a wealth of I mean, you can turn anywhere and, and, and be anywhere. Once everything is back up and running again, you can pretty much be anywhere and, and start just listen or get your horn and start playing with people. Yeah. You're always, you're always welcome. And I, I think that's, it's one of the things being here in Holland has, has kept me, uh, well, not, not just as a teacher, but I was able to do quite a bit of playing as well. And I, I've met some just wonderful people. In fact, a lot of American musicians, a lot of musicians from Chicago, uh, I found out later, I've ended up, uh, you know, settling in in the uh, in the Netherlands, and you know, of, of course, musicians always tend to gravitate toward one another. Somehow, they find one another, <laughs> and uh, and then it just all begins. You know, it just it just it just the associations never they never stop. Yeah. Well, another link that we, you and I have, you know, you talk about we find each other is our good friend Les Taylor. And Les, you said you had met Les uh, when we were off the air. You said you met Les at at Ball State. And, and in fact, Les was the one that said, you got to get a hold of Jim Yarnell and get him on your podcast because you guys been been chatting. But but Les turned me on to the Metropole Orchestra. Oh, uh, and and well, I'm sure you know them well. Tell us oh. a little bit. Tell our listeners a little bit about the Metropole Orchestra because they're oh, phenomenal. Oh, you give me goosebumps. I mean, just I, I, I have them on at least once a week. 
oh, what they're doing. Uh, it's a, it's an orchestra that was originally funded by the government. I think there is some subsidy by the government to do that, but it's sort of an experimental orchestra. I, I wouldn't call it, it's not a pops orchestra, but they're, uh, it's, it's a studio orchestra. They are into everything. And if any of you listeners out there want a real treat, you should listen to the recordings of the, Metro, the Metropole Orchestra with Snarky Puppy. I don't know if any of you are aware or familiar with the group Snarky Puppy. It's sort of a um, contemporary, ah, contemporary jazz rock fusion group out of New York. And they've done this album with the Metropole Orchestra. That's one Grammy Awards. Um, the Metropole Orchestra is known for its innovation for playing new music uh, in a in a modern context. I'm not I'm not only talking about classical music, but talking about pop music. I mean, it's a it's a studio orchestra basically, and uh, studio musicians. And it's it's uh, oh, if if uh, look it up on YouTube, everyone go to Metropole Orchestra, Metropole Orchestra, the Netherlands, and. Uh, uh, for you band directors out there, oh, 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 are you in for a treat? <laughs> yeah, that, that's something they got to turn their kids on to and get oh. a good pair of headphones and plug them in oh. and, and, oh, and give man. yourself some time because, man, this stuff is like just, I mean, it just captivates you. It's fantastic. Oh, oh yeah, that, that, that is a, if, if you're a young band director listening to this broadcast or an old band director, like, my, <laughs> you know, uh, one of the things you have to do is just, I mean, I could talk and talk about them, but, um, but this is something, this is a group that you, you really need to listen to. Um, uh, if you want inspiration and new ideas, if you're looking for new thoughts, new ideas, anything that they do is, is absolutely, absolutely phenomenal. And, absolutely. and who's that 94 year old trumpet player that plays with them once in a while? Um, uh, I think he's they play with Metropole. Maybe it's a different group. I don't know, but Les Les turned me on to him too. It's just like, man, it's just um, over the top good stuff, you know. Yeah. So, well, when was the last time you were back to the United States, Jim? Uh, let's see. The last time I was there, I was visiting. My, yeah, the last time I saw my 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 part of my family is in the United States. The last time I saw them was Christmas a year ago because of COVID. Mm -hmm. Um, I try to get back to uh, uh, see, I still have family living outside of Chicago. And I try to get back to Midwest, uh, you know, once every couple of years. I'm trying to get back there again this December. Um, uh, and I, I tie that in with the Midwest with Christmas and seeing my family and so on. So I, uh, once this COVID is over, I'll, I'll, I'll try to get back at least once, or once sometimes twice a year to uh, to reconnect again and everything. Uh, retirement, I don't know. Am I going to end up there? Am I going to end up in the United States or Holland? I, I really haven't thought that far ahead <laughs> yet. I'm, yeah. not really, I'm not really quite sure uh, what's going to happen. I, I really like it here, as you can see in the tone of my voice. Uh, it's, uh, it's So you said you got, one, you, got, say you got one more year left. So as, as you look back, what are you most proud of? Oh, boy. Um, well, there's been so many individual experiences that that have been, I mean, you know, concerts, you know, you know, presidents visiting the school and queens and, and you know, all those things have been wonderful. But I think that the I think that the thing that I look back at, apart from the concerts, is that when kids, you know, when the in the wonders of this technology age on Facebook or they send you emails. And they keep in touch with you and they and they say, hey, I remember that I remember that concert and I remember you and thank you for changing my life and thank you for being a part of this. You, you made my experience complete in, in school. And I think when I look back at it, I look at back at the memories of kids that really now, uh, in my particular case, uh, they're all over the world. Uh, uh, I just congratulated one of my former Japanese students on their on their Japanese winner of the Masters tournament. You know, <laughs> you know, and she writes me right back. She says, "Yes, I know." You know, it's just type something like something like that, and uh, um, and they 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 it, it, every I think there's almost every day there's a message that comes in via the alumni association or via Facebook or via something about a student 
who's into this or doing that. I got a picture once of a former trombone player of mine who was now a, a special investigator for the Royal Canadian Mounted Police in Vancouver, British Columbia. He does like skin dive, the, the scuba diving, does all that underwater research. He sent me a picture of him in a Royal Canadian Mounted Police outfit playing trombone. You know, and <laughs> you know when you get these are all. I mean, how do you replace those types of things? You know, you don't. You you can't replace that. And I, I know you don't have to be teaching overseas uh, to to have those experiences. I know that I'm in company of many incredible uh, band directors who have those same experiences. And I think when we're in the time and place of standing on the podium, um, we sometimes take for granted and forget how much we are affecting uh, kids' lives and how, how important we are uh, in, their, in their journey. Um, and I, I don't think that story is any different from, from many other uh, music teachers and band directors uh, throughout the world. Um, when those kids come back to you and they say, thank you, you you've made a difference in my life. Those, those are the, you know, when I, when I reminisce over this last year, it's going to be an emotional year for me this year coming up because bet. Bet. I'm already hearing from a lot of kids that said, you made, you made the difference. You made, you made this happen. And uh, I'll never forget that. And it's because of you that I'm doing what I'm doing right now. So wow. those, are the, those are the things. And, and like I say, I, I'm blessed. I, I've, I've had a wonderful, just a wonderful career with it, just incredible teachers and, and, and incredible students and incredible mentors. And uh, I feel like, I, like those people are a part of me. And um, I take, I take, um, I take pride in the idea of knowing that I'm I'm a part of these other people now, just just as the Alcaster Novas were in me. There's a little bit of Al in my students now, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. Isn't that kind of a cool thing? About That's me? absolutely cool. I mean, yeah. isn't isn't that what this is all about? Isn't that isn't that why we do this? Passing it on, paying it forward. You bet. Yeah, pay it forward, man. Yeah. yeah. So if if I'm listening, I'm a teacher here, and I have the slightest interest in teaching overseas at a, at a foreign school, what advice would you give me? If you're interested in teaching in a foreign school, um, you can always email me, <laughs> look me up on Facebook. I'll point you in the right direction uh, because we're always interested in having young, exciting, energetic uh, uh, music teachers, not just band directors, but there's a couple of organizations that you could, that you could look at. We started an organization years ago, uh, very proud of this, another significant uh, uh, accomplishment, I think, that we've been able to manage here. We started this organization called Association for Music in International Schools. It's A-M-I-S, AMI. Uh, anybody that wants to find out what's going on in international schools over, overseas, I mean, this is probably one of the most uh, networked music um, 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 organizations Ever. I mean, they're, they're very well started in Europe and now it's expanded to Asia and now, and now South America. If you wanted to get to know people, and, and that's how a lot of this works, getting to know people and getting to know what, what you do overseas, um, um, that would be one, one thing, I, I, one organization that I think you should, you should go to. Another one, if you're interested in finding employment or finding more about what's the job scene like, um, uh, there's this thing called the International School Services, ISS, International School Services, and they have a lot of recruitment fairs in the United States, uh, several of them throughout the year. And if you're interested in finding out about some of these jobs in China or Shanghai, which have incidentally incredibly large programs with, you know, uh, huge facilities, state-of-the-art facilities, um, uh, and, and primarily in China now of all places. I mean, it's just, it's just incredible the I mean, these are, these are like community colleges, some of these schools. And um, uh, you, can, uh, you can have a very fruitful, fruitful uh, fulfilling career uh, traveling. A lot of music teachers, what they do is they wanna, they wanna travel the world and see the world. So they'll, they'll do a stint of three or four years in say Shanghai and then do another stint in Oman and then do something in Dubai and then come to Europe and you know, spend some time in England and then go to South America. So they're, they're teaching in all these international schools. But the cool thing about that 
is that no matter where you teach, you know these people, <laughs> you know the other teachers, and you're all you're all teaching the same. You're still you could be a half a world apart. You're still teaching sort of the same curriculum, um, and that's really that's that's really 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 cool, you know. And then we have these these get-togethers and festivals every so often, and I don't think we sleep too much, and uh, <laughs> we we sure have a lot of fun you know, talking about music in schools and kids and so on. Well, Jim, you got any final? Th oh, go ahead. Yeah. No, those are two organizations that I think that would that any of you who's listening to this that uh, that you want to know more about international education that those are two organizations that I think you should uh, tie into. Yeah, for sure. So, you got any final thoughts you want to share before we wrap this thing up? Well, what I want to say, Charlie, is that um, that I want to thank you for this opportunity to do this. This has been an honor and a privilege, and I want to thank you for everything that you've done for music education and for band directors, and the fact that you're still in your retirement age, still active and still and still connecting us all. So, um, uh, this is this is of value and important to all of us. So, uh, so I, I just want to. I'm honored and privileged to to be a part of this conversation. So, thank you very much. Well, it's my pleasure, buddy. And I look forward to seeing you at the Midwest in December. Yes, I plan to be there. All right. Looking forward to it too. And hopefully we'll be able to give each other not virtual hugs, but real hugs. Uh, I look forward <laughs> to it. Thanks, Jim. <laughs> Thank you, Charlie. Appreciate it. Okay, take care. Bye-bye. During our lives, we're fortunate to meet many people from different walks of life. And it doesn't take long, at least for me, to look at someone, speak to them for a few minutes, and know if they are a class act. That's the way it was the first time I met Jim Yarnell. And after our visit, I would say over 20 years later, my feelings have not changed. Jim has been a force, a real force and leader in band music education in Europe, and especially the American School Network around the world. He is a fine musician, a great teacher, and a terrific human being. Jim Yarnell is one more reason I am blessed to have been a band director. Well, that's Band Talk with Charlie Mangini and friends. As always, thanks to my friends at Hal Leonard, Kevin Lepper's Advantage Network Percussion, Eastman Music Company, Vandercook College of Music, and the thepodcastingstore.com. I'll be back with more great conversations, but for now, this is your host, Charlie Mangini, saying... Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening to Band Talk with Charlie Mangini and Friends. If you would like to send a question to Charlie or have a comment, please send an email to bandtalkcharlie at gmail.com. We hope you will let your colleagues, students, and friends know about Band Talk with Charlie Mangini and Friends. Thanks for joining us, and we look forward to being with you again soon.